Thank you for joining. So my name is Arno, Arno Lohrs. I'm part of the Open Technology Group at IBM. I've been working in open source since forever. I started in 1990, actually, <laughs> believe it or not. So, um, and I'm involved in OpenSSF. I've been involved in many different uh, technologies in the open source space over my career. After the last uh, two and a half years now, I've been focusing primarily on the open source security, working with the OpenSSF, and um, I'm currently the vice chair of the technical advisory committee, and I participate in different groups uh, within OpenSSF. So my goal today is to try to get you a better understanding of some of the technologies that are being developed at OpenSSF, and so I have a, a panel of esteemed colleagues that I've invited to join me here today. And we're going to try together to give you a clearer picture maybe of different names you may have heard of. So let me let them first introduce themselves. We can start with you, Isaac. Thanks, Arno. Um, I'm Isaac. Uh, I work as a product manager at Google um, in the OpenSSF. Um, I chair the Supply Chain Integrity Working Group. Um, I've been involved with Salsa, um, SigStore, Guac, um, various other OpenSSF projects. And uh, yeah, thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Marcella. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Marcella Malara. I'm a research scientist at Intel Labs. Um, I also serve on the TAC in the OpenSSF and as a maintainer for a couple of the Intoto projects over in the CNCF. So, yeah. Uh, I'm Jay, I'm a security principal program manager at uh, Microsoft uh, within the OpenSSF. I co-chair the supply and security working group with, uh, with Isaac and, um, and Mike. And um, I also co-lead the uh, S2C2F project, um, which is one of the things we'll be talking about here today. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Lieberman. I'm a co-founder of a software supply chain security startup called Kusari. Um, in the uh, you know open source space, I'm a CNCF tag security lead. Um, I'm also a member of the OpenSSF TAC and governing board. And I'm also a uh, maintainer of a couple of different uh, open source projects, including, uh, you know, including both Salsa and uh, Guac. All right, thank you guys. So I'll start with a few slides. Don't worry, it's not gonna be a very long presentation. I just want to kind of give you a, an idea of what we're talking about to get us started. And then we'll try to get into an actual discussion with the panel. So first, I think it should, probably to not surprise to anybody here, uh, you open source, you know, I, like I said earlier, I've been involved in open source pretty much my whole career. And for me, it's nice to see that the role of open source has only, you know, kept growing more and more. And today's, you know, we hear numbers all the time that the majority of software out there now use some open source internally anyway. So that's the good news. The not so good news is that at the same time, open source is becoming a primary target for bad actors who are actually using open source projects, vulnerabilities in different areas to try to infiltrate, insert vulnerabilities into software, which again, because it's used everywhere, it's a very uh, uh, good target. I mean, essentially the way I think about this is, I think as an industry, we've become much better at making systems that are in production much more robust. But we, it's a bit of the Achilles heel. We have not been very careful at taking care of the open source supply chain. All these open source dependencies that we have introduced in our, in our software have not necessarily been you know, uh, maintained properly. And so this is now being exploited and we have literally an explosion of vulnerabilities being inserted in the open source. So this is a big problem that's you know, impacting the whole industry. We're talking about like millions of open source projects. It's, bigger, it's a bigger problem than any organization, no matter how big it is, can tackle on their own. So as an industry, and I have to say also under civil forces, including governments, that around the world have started developing different regulations to say, hey, industry, you cannot just keep going that way because it's costing money. There's safety issues now related to you know, personal information being leaked when there's vulnerabilities being exploited. And so 
We see it in the US, we see it in Europe and in Asia, there are similar regulations being developed where governments are basically trying to start imposing uh, uh, regulations on the industry to get this problem under control. So we actually started uh, quite a few years ago, the industry got together, several industry players said, okay, we need to start tackling this problem. So we created OpenSSF. Initially, that was actually during the COVID years, and everybody was a bit afraid of what the economic impact was going to be. So there was very little money put behind it. And the, code, the, 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 the project got started within the Lynx Foundation, but pretty much you know, left on its own without much resources to get really organized. So it actually, after the, uh, the COVID, when people realized, okay, the world has not fallen apart <laughs> and the economy still exists, companies like IBM and Google, Microsoft and others said, all right, let's get serious about this problem because of course, in the meantime, the problem has not disappeared by any means, it's only grown. So we basically relaunched OpenSSF with real backing and funding behind it. And so we have now a fully featured Linux Foundation organization. We're benefiting from the Linux Foundation umbrella. And this is the kind of activity we have. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. This is basically our governance structure. Uh, we have a board and then the technical advisory committee and underneath there's a whole bunch of different working groups and projects. Projects are essentially code oriented, primarily developing code, some, some tool or some, some code of some kind. And then we have a bunch of different working groups which are primarily about like, you know, talking about different aspects of the issue and then developing different deliverables, some of which may be projects, okay? So what we're going to talk about today is actually this one green box over there on the left side, Supply Chain Integrity Working Group. All right, this is to give you an idea that we are going to see a little piece of the cake, right? This is another view where we're kind of expanding all the different boxes with the different working groups, and it shows you a little bit what's inside. Again, I'm not going to get into the detail, you can browse through the OpenSSF website and discover all these different activities. But I hope it gives you a sense of the scale of what's going on. Again, what we are going to talk about today is that green box pretty much in the middle of the bottom, the column there, um, and it's a supply chain integrity. And we'll talk about, we have representative here of the different projects that are at play within this uh, uh, working group within OpenSSF. So, this is another view. It touches on the problem of the software supply chain. Essentially, you start with some, you know, developer producing code, then there's the management of the source code, and then it goes through some build process. As part of the build, you incorporate different dependencies, and then you generate some package, some artifact that can then be consumed. And there's a cycle, of course, because this package can itself become a dependency of another, etc. The problem is every single point of that graph basically is a, an attack vector. So what we're trying to do in OpenSSF, this slide basically attempts to map all the different activities that are going on in OpenSSF to the different parts of this graph. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about how these different pieces talk to, uh, get to uh, come together. But let's get started with diving into some of the pieces related again to the green box in the middle there, supply chain integrity. So let's start with Salsa. So I'm going to ask Marcela if you could tell us what Salsa is about. Okay. So um, I tend to think of Salsa as having sort of two main pieces. First is a set of requirements that software producers, so that is developer on the developer uh, level and the build platform level. Um, and, and what Salsa provides for both of those two groups is essentially um, it, three levels of uh, requirements to incrementally implement higher integrity for your builds. 
Um, so that's one piece. Um, the other piece is what I imagine some folks here may have heard of, and that's the Salsa of Provenance. Um, that is a metadata document that essentially is a detailed record of the of what happened during a build process. Um, yeah, I'll start with that. All right, thank you. J, S2C2F. Uh, sure, S2C2F, Secure Supply Chain Consumption Framework. Um, it's a security model, a security framework for how we consume open source software. It takes you through eight different practices and four different levels of maturity, um, all the way from how you ingest open source to then how you fix it and then move it back upstream uh, in order to help um, with the more uh, critical vulnerabilities in real time. In a nutshell. That's all right. We will get back to dive a little bit deeper in each piece after. So, Michael, talk us to us about Guac and maybe GitHub. Sure. Um, so uh, let me start a little bit with, with uh, GitHub. So GitHub is a little uh, earlier on. It's, it's a, a new project um, inside the underneath the Supply Chain Integrity Working Group. Um, it's very much focused on taking Tough, which is the update framework, um, which is a CNCF project, and applying the same sort of rules that it does, which is um, around distributing content securely to how can you distribute sort of um, source code changes securely and how can you look at permissioning um, Git uh, in a platform agnostic way. So how can you enforce policy regardless of whether or not you're on GitHub or GitLab or some other um, source code uh, host. And then um, Guac is very much focused on, so if Salsa is focused on producers, um, S2C2F is focused on consumers, Guac is focused on getting data about all this information in the hands of those who need it. So uh, Guac is a tool that ingests um, software supply chain metadata, including in toto Salsa attestations, including SBOMs, including uh, OpenSSF scorecard, OSV, uh, a bunch of other supply chain metadata information ingests all of it, um, parses it all out into a giant graph, and then lets you query information about it. So for example, you can then use that information to then say, hey, am I actually, when I ingest software, am I conforming to S2C2F? Thank you, and there's a scorecard kind of thing, a uh, bonus card, I should say, is like Fresca. You may have heard of Fresca. <laughs> it's actually officially off the chart at this point. We have archived but there are still people asking about it, and Michael was the lead of this project, so I want him to just say a few things about it so people know if they hear about it, what it is. Sure. Um, so Fresca uh, is a um, implementation of the CNCF's Secure Software Factory reference architecture, so it's just a secure build um, system, and so uh, it was an architecture that the example implementation was... Um, uh, Tecton plus Tecton Chains plus Tetragon for eBPF plus a bunch of other things uh, like uh, Spiffy Spire to sort of wrap the entire CI pipeline um, to make it more secure and have uh, implement all these great practices that we're talking about here. And, um, you know, it's sort of achieved its goal and a lot of folks are currently using it, not like the code itself, but looking at it as the example that they can then use to build out their own stuff. All right. Thank you. So... Isaac, you're the chair of the SCI Working Group, which basically is the umbrella for all these different projects we've been talking about. Can you give people an idea of how all these different pieces fit together? Uh, I can certainly try. Um, so, I, I mean, I think, I mean, the, the first observation I, I would make is, you know, related to your earlier slide about, you know, just the amount of open source that we see in commercial software today. And, you know, within the OpenSSF, we have the Supply Chain Integrity Working Group. And I think, you know, if, if you're within, you know, a very technical community and you're working in open source, it makes sense to have the supply chain integrity specialism. I think for most organizations, you know, outside of the weeds, when they think of supply chain security, they think about the integrity of their ingredients. And for the most part, those ingredients of the software are open source. And so there's actually a, a large, uh, you know, a, a large degree of overlap between, you know, open source security generally and what supply chain security looks like to most organizations. They, they, you know, there's, a, I think, a very natural conflation of the two that, you know, if I'm making software and 95% of the software is open source, 
and I'm concerned about my ingredients, I'm, you know, I think of open source security as, as essentially integral as a whole to my supply chain security. But I think, um, you know, looking at open source, like I, I've been thinking recently about open source as, you know, a chainsaw. And the awesome thing about chainsaws are that they're chainsaws, right? Um, and they're, they're awesome. And if you're in the lumberjacking business, you don't want to be without one. Um, they're immensely powerful. Um, they give you huge leverage. And they actually democratize a lot of power. Like I can go down to Home Depot and buy myself a chainsaw and start felling trees. Um, chainsaws are awesome because they're chainsaws. Chainsaws are inherently dangerous, and there are things we might do to chainsaws to make them less dangerous. Um, we might invent anti-kickback mechanisms, we might invent interlocks on the throttle, we might invent uh, vibration dampening, uh, we might invent inertial brakes for the chains. All of these things have been invented, are in common chainsaws today, to make chainsaws inherently safer. But there's an amount you have to do when you're using the chainsaw too. I would advise you to wear uh, Kevlar pants, a ripstop shirt, hard hat, goggles, nice gloves, all this kind of stuff, and take care. And you know what, when you're taking a chair, when you're taking an inherently dangerous object, you're using it and applying mitigations to how you use it in practice, you may also want to think about, you know, putting up a sign saying, beware chainsaw in use or something, and talking about the residual risk of the situation. So I really like this as a model that, you know, open source has there's an inherent set of risk, um, and you know, Salsa is, is part of an effort to, to drive down the inherent risk in how open source software is produced and make sure that when you pick a chainsaw off the shelf in Home Depot, it's the one that the manufacturer intended. It's not been tampered with. It's got the right set, they've got the right tamper proof sealing on the package and all that kind of stuff. I may also, while I'm buying my chainsaw at Home Depot, may go pick up some ripstop pants and a Kevlar shirt and all this kind of stuff as well. And so thinking about Salsa and S2C2F as there's an inherent safety part of this equation and there's a safety in use, safety in consumption and part of this equation too. And then of course there's some residual risk which every organization has to reason about too. Um, Guac solves for me the overall observability of the system where, you know, hey, I want to go onto my work site and pick up a chainsaw and understand who bought it, where did it come from, are there any manufacturer recalls on this thing, when was it last serviced, who was it issued to, everything I need to know to manage the life cycle of that chainsaw and its operational use. Um, I think Guac is a great, uh, you know, great solution in that observability space, telling us everything we need to know about the artifacts in our pipelines um, and what we need to know about them. All right, thank you. So let's go a level deeper now. Uh, Marcela, can you first tell us a little bit more about the status of Salsa? Okay, yeah. Um, so where is Salsa today? Um, so version one was released about a year ago. Um, since then, the uh, Salsa project has been working on a couple of different directions. So. To sort of set the context, uh, version one of the Salsa specification focused on um, essentially defining these three levels of integrity for builds and requirements needed to, to achieve that level of integrity. Um, and, and also, like I said, that other piece, which is the, the prominence document, which serves really to um, like provide evidence that you have met a specific Salsa level. Um, so since um, the work has focused on sort of expanding and enhancing the existing uh, requirements, the existing, um, uh, the, the scope really of, of Salsa, um, where Salsa today focuses very much on the build process, which as I'm sure you know, is actually a very complicated process and system. Um, the, the project has started, um, expanding to um, protecting the the source code that is used in a build as the the input basically right um, there's been some work on dependencies um, and there's also been this third work stream on um, providing additional integrity for the build platforms themselves so that's this underlying really important system that um, we currently trust a lot um, but is also imperfect sometimes or, or just not immune to security issues. So um, there, there's ongoing work uh, in these three, three areas. Um, 
and yeah, we could definitely, I think, always use uh, community input on, on all of those. Jay, what's the status with S2C2F? Sure. Um, S2C2F has seen such tremendous growth uh, since its adoption um, in the openness of stuff and, 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 and exciting. Um, we've achieved many adopters who've actually taken it into their organizations, tested it out, tried it, provided input. We've incorporated that input. Um, it's constantly evolving and expanding such that um, we've, we're, we are now an official project, right? Um, and uh, we're, we're actually um, set to uh, enter the pass process, the pass submission process here. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, we have a meeting about that this week. Um, so we're looking towards international um, standard, becoming an international standard um, for how uh, we consume um, open source and mainly around dependency management. So, so I guess as we continue on, we'll talk about that a little further as well, because that's what's at the root of a, of a S2C2, but that's the status of it today. We're extremely excited. Um, all the maintainers are in this room right now, right? So, so um, you know, we, we're, we're, we're uh, and please, if you, if you have any additional questions about that or you want to get involved, I mean, we're going to probably have that at the end too. Uh, how can you get involved? You can talk to any one of us and we'd be happy to have you. Yeah, for those who are not familiar with this fast pass process, it's like, you know, it refers to how you can get a specification that was developed in a consortium like OpenSSF and move it more quickly to a de jure standards organization like JTC1. And so there are organizations that have been accredited, recognized as, you know, you've done enough work to get the spec developed in an open way, etc that you're entitled to push it into the official de jure standards process without having to start from, you know, as if you had not done any work until now. So it's an accelerated process, basically. So Michael, tell us more about the status of GUAC. Sure, yeah, so um, GUAC today uh, is is not quite 1.0 yet, but we're, we're uh, reaching for it. And to kind of talk a little bit, um, you know, piece by piece. So on an ingestion side, uh, you know, we ingest both uh, SPDX and Cyclone DX SBOMs. Um, and we're always looking to also ingest, uh, you know, new things as they emerge. But we ingest Salsa, we ingest Scorecard, we ingest OSV, uh, we ingest information from depths.dev and a bunch of other things as well. Um, and we're looking always for new sort of emerging standardized sort of data types to kind of pull in that are useful to sort of building out that supply chain security picture. And then on the output side, um, we are starting to stabilize around our API more. So we have a GraphQL API and, um, you know, it's relatively uh, uh, stable, but we're still working to kind of finalize uh, that. Um, and in addition to that, we're building some extra sort of tools as well uh, to make it um, easier for end users to use who don't want to necessarily learn a whole GraphQL API and just want to run some simpler queries. Um, and, you know, we have also sort of gotten a good deal of adoption within uh, the community and additional contributors. So just as a reminder, the project itself was started by folks over at Kusari, over at Google and Purdue University. And now we also have contributors from Red Hat and, and Microsoft and, and all sorts of places uh, now. All right. Thank you. So, Isaac, I'm going to get back to you and we're going to get into the harder questions because so in your opinion, what are the challenges that we are facing and that those technologies specifically address <clears throat> and maybe don't address? Gosh. Um, well, I can make it more specific. You know, we heard of the, 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 the latest uh, vulnerability, right? Everybody heard about XZ and, uh, you know, in general, We've been working on these technologies for over two years, right? And some people say, okay, but are you making a difference? So, yeah, this is, it's a great question. So I, I have a few thoughts about XZ. Um, I mean, the first one is, you know, the, the, I mean, in terms of the timeline, um, 
you know, I think, you know, the log4j folks are obviously feeling very relieved because they're out of the hot seat now, XZ is in the hot seat, and when everyone points to think about that thing, it's going to be XZ and not log4j anymore. Um, but the interest, one of the interesting things about XZ was the timeline, right? And if you look at the, you know, the very first moment that Jiatan shows up on the scene, that was actually pre-log4j. That was October um, 2021, um, before um, Log4j raised all our collective consciousnesses in the supply chain domain. Um, and so that, that timeline was so, so very long. And I think, you know, part of, you know, what you might take away from that is that, gosh, it's that type of commitment and that type of investment you now need to make in order to land a successful exploit. And so there are some senses you can look at this and go, well, this is, you know, the, the fact that it takes, you know, such a dedication, such a long time frame and a, a play that is, is so, so very detailed from end to end in order to subvert supply chain security. Perhaps some of that is to do with, you know, the work that we've been done, we've been doing. I think the other interesting thing about XZ is that, um, you know, if you, if you zoom out a little bit, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about, is that, uh, it, you know, there's a subversion of, uh, you know, the, the predominant threat model that we have or, or you know, the, a, a prevailing threat model, certainly in OpenSSF, is that maintainers are trustworthy. And so looking at uh, projects like scorecards, the scorecard threat model, you know, has maintainer trust built into that threat model. If you throw out maintainer trust and say now you can have, you know, bad actors be maintainers, of critical open source software packages, um, it's actually surprising how much that that undermines in, in what we've done. And I think that that really requires a whole lot of rethinking about you know how do we operate in a world where maintainers now can be adversaries. Um, so um, I mean I, I think the other observation I'd make about XZ and this is something that uh, I've been thinking a lot about recently is that you know if if you are an actor who is going to launch an attack with a two and a half year timeline you would be crazy to do just one of those at once. You would be, uh, it would be very, very surprising if that was the only one. You would not do them one at a time back to back. You'd launch 20 at once and try and land as many as you can. Um, and so, yeah, hey, you know, we, we managed to, uh, you know, take this one out, but something that's on my mind is, you know, where are the other 15, right? Or how many have already landed? And so, you know, prob probabilistically, you know, <laughs> which if, if you were to pick out of the 20 that are in flight, uh, and find, you know, you detect a random one is unlikely to be the first one. Um, perhaps, you know, the other four have already landed undetected. Um, but I think, you know, there's, it certainly, it highlights the importance of the space, right? It highlights the vulnerability that we all have and the risk that we all take. And, and it comes back to the idea of residual risk that no matter how safely you make the chainsaw, no matter how fly your Kevlar pants are, you're still taking some risk using the chainsaw. Um, and I think you know, part of what I don't want to see happen is people throwing out security solutions because they're seen as partial or it wouldn't have stopped XZ or it wouldn't have done that because you know, that, that philosophy is behind the same, you know, the same idea. We, you know, seat belts are no use because there's a whole ton of accident types where they don't save lives. People still get killed. You know, the, the conclusion you should draw is not, okay, well, seatbelts aren't doing any good, people are still getting killed on the road, let's not do seatbelts then. The conclusion is that, you know, seatbelts, that covers a class of threats, they're not perfect, but gosh, they're beneficial. Let's see what other things we can layer on that are also beneficial. Defense in depth is a thing, incrementality is a thing. And so what I don't want people to, to look at XZ and say, well, gosh, you know, all of this wasted effort in supply chain security because attacks are still getting through. I think part of what the industry has got to face is, is the idea that attacks will always get through. And so part of what we need to be doing is, yes, chainsaw safety, yes, hard hats and goggles and everything, but yes, you also need to make sure you have a resilient organization that can respond correctly when attacks land. And Guac is a part of that, frankly. I think being able to use Guac to look at what is the blast radius, what is my exposure, and use Guac to, within a day of a new attack landing, find out where in your organization you need to take action right now. And so I think Guac is a great part of the resilient stories. Excuse me as well. All right, thank you very much. That's great. Uh, I'll open to the other panelists if they want to add something, and then we'll open to the public if they have questions. Do you want to add something? You don't have to. <laughs> she, she, she handed me the mic. <laughs> <laughs> You're easy. Um, well, all I'll add is this, and, uh, and I'll, <laughs> I'll add on to what, to what Isaac is saying, and, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring up the chainsaw again. I think it's, I think chainsaw is special in this. Um, in the context of, of what we're talking about here, what would happen if um, after you have your Kevlar on, 
And, and the only way I can equate this, right, is, is um, when, when I was in the military, I was in, I was in jump school, right, when, when I, was, I was airborne. And um, so you, you have, your, you have your, your chainsaw, you have your Kevlar, you have your gear, right, you have your gloves, you, you have all your safety equipment. What happens if, if you had another person that also checked to make sure that not only did you have all of those things, but they were the right things. That your chainsaw had the right safety on and off switches, safe switches, right? So you can't just turn it on and it runs. No, do you have to turn the key? Do you have to flip the switch? Do you have to do this or that other? And, and that person, after all the checks are said and done, that person flips the switch and they can only flip the switch so that you can then use said send chase, all right. So that so that so in terms of control in my mind, just to add on what he said, what happens if you had that extra bit of, of protection uh, around it, right? It's just that process there. It, it actually touches on the peer review that uh, a lot of projects have. Right. Unfortunately, it's not always practical. You might want to know that, for instance, in the Node.js space, the mean number for maintainers for packages in Node.js is one. So, Mike, go ahead. And uh, sure, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think the only thing I, I would add, because I totally agree with uh, Jay and Isaac and all that, I, I think the only thing I would sort of add in there is, is to not forget that at the end of the day, even though it's about software and software supply chain, what is behind that? It's all about the people, right? It's it's not just, you need to understand both the people who want to attack the supply chain, who are looking to compromise things, but also looking at the people who are developing these things and approaching it from a place of empathy and understanding that, you know, especially in the open source space, a lot of folks are very overworked, uh, underpaid and all that as well. As well. So when when sort of thinking about this, we, we I think the thing that needs to come across well is that we're here to help we're not here to burden you any more than you're already burdened. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, any questions, anybody? Um, we're only scratching the surface of a major problem. I'm sure there are other questions. We cannot have explained everything. Go ahead, Alan. So, this, this is... is fantastic and I love seeing how everything fit together so this is a super helpful to sort of hear this um, from the US government a lot of our interest is not necessarily with um, organizations that are say natives of the cloud if we're lucky they are very recent immigrants and so of the tools here where would you suggest those of us who are focused on critical infrastructure or not necessarily the laggards but you know the middle of the pack, where should they really start? And what are the tools that we should maybe put our efforts into to make them more accessible, right? A lot of these are amazing, but they're bleeding edge. What should we be targeting for shovel ready, low investment approaches? Um, having lived in that world for, for about 15 years, um, <sighs> God, I'd still say concentrate on the data. Go where the data is, right? Um, you, you, you can't go wrong then. You, you protect the data as the data moves. And you mentioned critical infrastructure. You mentioned, I think you said, I said immigrants as well. You try to get as close to that as humanly possible. Get as close to the physical layer as humanly possible. Secure that piece and then let that stuff move outwards, right? I mean, I think uh, when, when I used to do it, uh, Back in the day, we were very successful there. When we tried to cure cancer, we, 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 it fell apart instantly. But when we just sat there with little small symptoms here and there, little small things, and we, and we, you know, we treated this, we treated that, you know, we were able to kind of solve problems, and that's all. We solved problems. We, we put out fires for the most part, but it worked. So if you is well, I can't I can't say a starting point because they do different things, but they move against the middle, right? Um, so I would say depending upon what where you're concentrating your efforts or what's important to you at the time, S2C2F might be a factor for you. Salsa may be a factor for you, but Guac is kind of all encompassing where you really do want that 
that archival approach. You really do want that thing that says, hey, did you meet the criteria? This? Did you meet the criteria of that? And this is how you can uh, you know, have a real-time graphical representation of did we do this properly if we're focusing on here or there? Right? Can you pass the microphone sure. to me? Yeah, I, I, I want to add, um, I think we, we tend to be very tool oriented and just want something that we can use immediately. And I think that's only part of the solution. Um, there are organizations and services that do just that on behalf of uh, users. So if you want to see, um, I think it, the, part of the solution needs to be to enhance the underlying systems and services that we rely on to uh, build our software, store our software, analyze our software, right? Um, so I think just going to those places or finding the, the avenues uh, to, to get in contact with, with those organizations I think is going to be really important. So like I'm, I'm coming at this from the salsa perspective a little bit where uh, one of the guiding principles is literally uh, trust the platform, verify the artifacts, right? Um, and the reason for that principle being there is that it is much more scalable to implement changes in the platforms or the services that so many of us use than expecting individuals to uh, implement everything individually, right? So. Um, I guess what I'm saying is uh, we'd really like your input on how we can change some of those underlying systems. I think I'd, I'd add one more thing, which I, I think, you know, something you're speaking to, Adam, is, um, you know, that so much of this is a change management problem, right? I, don't, I think so much of this is not a technology problem, it's a change management problem. And I think the, the good thing, the thing I look at in, in the SCI Working Group at OpenSF, and I look at SUC2F, I look at Salsa, I think there's a recognition of that fact in their tiered structure. You know, I've, I've described Salsa as being, you know, it's a ladder, and no matter how high up you are, you can just climb on the ladder wherever you are, and each rung is, is reachable from the left, and so you can kind of hop on the ladder and then climb up. Um, SUC2F is similarly structured with a set of tiered requirements, and so, my answer, you know, where do you start? I would say start at the bottom of the ladder, if that's where you are, and climb the ladder. Um, and the frameworks we built have been designed with that in mind, have been designed to be sympathetic to the essential change management components of this problem. Um, I think it's, it's interesting from a, the other, I mean, from, from a Guac perspective, um, you know, when Guac was, was just beginning, one of the things I had in mind was, you know, at, at some point, given the executive order, at some point, the U.S. federal government is going to wake up to a quarter of a million S-bombs in its inbox and wondering what to do with them. Um, and I think Guac is actually a great answer to that problem. Like, I frame Guac as solving that. What do you do with a quarter of a million S-bombs? You throw them in Guac and, uh, and start querying them. Um, so I think Guac is a tool that you can, you can take and adopt, and no matter what data you've got, whether you've got Cyclone DX or S-bombs or Assault of Provenance or VEX documents, throw as much as you have into Guac and have Guac make sense of it. With Salsa, with S2C2F, there are these tiered level structures um, to hope to address this, this essential change management concern that you bring up. All right, I was hoping we'd be able to have more and more question. You can finish with it. Sure, yeah, the only other thing I was gonna add on there is, yeah, so, so I think it's, it's really about the practices more than necessarily the tools. And it's about understanding what practices you're even doing in the first place, which I think is one of the big issues. And so, like, that's another, you know, one of the other goals of Guac, but it c doesn't just have to be Guac, right? It can be any sort of tool that you're using to sort of track this stuff. My recommendation would be track what you actually are doing and what you aren't doing. What you aren't doing is also just as important because that unknown is, is huge because then you know, oh, that's the thing I should be going after. I'm not doing this. Not, and, or you just know, maybe I could be doing it, but I'm not tracking it. So tracking it is, I think, yeah. All right, thank you. So I want to thank the panelists today. We're out of time. I saw several other hands raised. We'll be around. Please reach out and get involved. OpenSSF is a member-driven company. It's funded by member companies, but it's not limited to members. Anybody can join any of the groups that I was talking about or listing on the, on the slides earlier on. So feel free to join. We don't bite. We try to be welcoming. You know, there are, there's a public calendar that lists all the different calls that are going on throughout the week. Just join. 
pick the topic that's more of, that's of most interest to you and join. And uh, usually we try to, at the beginning of the calls to ask if they, somebody is new, they can introduce themselves. If you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to. And just you can just be listening. Or if you have a problem you want to present, feel free to do so. And pick your, pick your topic and join us. I mean, there's a lot to do. We don't claim to be able to solve it all. But we're, at least we're trying. And you're very welcome to join us in doing so. So thank you for joining us today. <laughs>